we've been journeying through the book of Acts. Acts is written uh, by the Apostle Luke. It is oftentimes considered an extension of the, the Gospel of Luke, as it outlines one Gentiles, which is who is anybody who is a Jew, all of us, most of us, are one of the three, we're all not Jews, right? But <laughs> anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile. So it, it outlines the, the acceptance of, of Gentiles into salvation. Um, the beginning of the church, and how the church um, spreads the gospel throughout the world. So that's kind of the overview of the book of Acts. And we are in chapter 14, talking about revolutionary living. We'll start reading at verse 8. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. In Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet and had never walked, for he had been crippled from birth. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked at him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas and what they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was out just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are mortals just like you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to follow their own ways, yet he has not left himself without a witness in doing good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds, then they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples surrounded him, he got up and went into the city. The next day he went on with Barnabas to Derby. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. You say thanks be to God. So, stay focused when adverse conditions intensify. Stay focused when adverse conditions intensify. Let's bow the word. God, you are gracious and kind to us, and um, we do not want to presuppose that we are already in a place where we can hear you. So God, we ask that you help us by your spirit to open ourselves to you, each of us individually and collectively, to receive from you. God, such that this word may take root, that it may grow, and that it may materialize fruit in our life and the things that we do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when I was in North Carolina, got another brother from North Carolina, good to see you. <laughs> when I was in North Carolina, I can remember going to Costco one day and I was getting ready to pull into a parking space. The parking space was to the right. You know how you pull up a little bit and you swing out just a little bit to pull into the space, right? For those of you who drive. Well, there was a man who was coming down the aisle of the, of the parking lot. He was about three cars up, right? I pull up, I swing out a little bit, and I pull into the park, the parking space. Well, a few minutes later, a few seconds later, here he comes running up to the back of my car, screaming and yelling at me, saying that I tried to hit him. <laughs> so I'm sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, like, Jesus, please come get your cousin me on right? <laughs> <laughs> I stayed in my car because I didn't know, you know, what in the world to do, right? Because I wasn't sure if this man was there. Stay, but all I know is that I was nowhere near hitting this man, and he was convinced that I tried to hit him. So he stood there glaring at me for a few minutes. And then he walked away. So I waited a few more minutes, hoping it had completely passed. I get out of my car, only to discover that he has gotten in his car and came around about two cars up from my car. As soon as he sees me get out, I know I'm thinking that in my head too. What? Like, this is crazy. He pulls up and he continues to chew me out. I'm so thankful that I'm in a public place, right? Because, you know, even if something happens to me, I got witnesses, right? I just walk around his car. Threw some cars on the road across from, from where I was parked and up the other aisle of the parking lot into the store. 
And even when I came out of the store, I was still a bit apprehensive that this man may, may still be there waiting for me. This just goes to show that sometimes we think things are over, but they're not. So that's where we find ourselves in our passage today. For those of you who were with us last week, you can remember that the passage in chapter 13, the account ended with Paul and Barnabas shaking the dust of Antioch from their feet. But what we discover in chapter 14 is that that dust was mad that it got shook off. Mm -hmm. And it followed them where they went. They go first to a place called Iconium. And it's like deja vu. It's exactly like what they encountered in Antioch in chapter 13. Right? They start preaching in the synagogue. Some people believe, some people don't. But the people who don't believe, right, start messing with the minds of the folk who are kind of on the fence. Right? And they raise up people to persecute them, and they, they decide that they're going to stone them. So Paul and Barnabas leave. Now they don't leave the city in order to hide. They leave and go to another city and keep preaching. Right? And when they get to this second city, Lystra, right, which is the passage that we read this morning, they again start preaching. Paul starts preaching. And they see a man. Paul sees a man who's been crippled from birth. And he tells the man, stand up. And the man gets up and he begins to walk. And the crowds go wild at seeing this miracle. They're like, oh my goodness, he just healed this man. He's walking. They must be gods in human form. Zeus and Hermes. So they mistake them for Greek gods who have come to incarnate in human form. Well, Paul and Barnabas, as they should be, are very bothered by this. And they tear their clothes, right? Which shows that they are, they disapprove of this blasphemy. And they run out and they begin to teach them, no, 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 no. We are just like you. We're mortal just like you. This is about God, right? God has given us as witness to you so that you can know who he is. And these people can't hear them at all. They are still trying to offer sacrifice to them as the gods Zeus and Hermes. Well, I don't know how much time lapsed between now, whether it was immediately or sometime later, but the account tells us that the people from both Antioch and Iconium have now reached the city. They have followed them to where they are. The people who drove them out of Antioch and were going to stone them in Iconium have followed Paul and Barnabas into Lystra. And when they get there, they stir up the crowds and they begin to stone Paul. So what this means is that the same people who were saying, Paul, you are a god, in a moment's time have now switched to, we're going to kill you. <laughs> right? Unable to understand and comprehend the truth. So they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city limits, which is the custom at that time. And Barnabas and the new believers in that space made their way outside of the city and they surround Paul. The account says that when they surround Paul, he stands up and he goes to the next city. So in your free time, I hope that you will read the rest of this chapter because it's a pretty phenomenal account. All right? They go to the next city the next day. And I know the scripture doesn't say that, you know, Jesus miraculously healed Paul, but I don't know anybody who gets stoned to near death unless, like I said this morning, maybe P -P -P um, Paul was faking it. Like, I don't know. I, I would probably fake it. Right? They're trying to kill me. Oh, and then, <laughs> but either way, he was being hit by stones, so he had to be hurt some kind of way, right? So he's preaching and he's hurt, and so either way, it's, it's the strength of God, right? And the strength of God made him smart enough to fake it or whatever. So, he's preaching the next day, and they return to the three cities. The three cities responsible for stoning him. They return to those cities in order to strengthen the believers there. They fast and pray, and they appoint leaders, right? Because they are apostles, they are planting churches, right? And then they return to the other city named Antioch, or called Antioch, to rest with some of the disciples, all right? So this is where we are. Now, last week we talked about staying focused under adverse conditions. And this week we're gonna add to that list. We talked about three things last week. Last week we said that you're gonna stay focused under adverse conditions, you need to be mindful to not move before God does. Right? We also said that you need to be able to resist the initial urge to quit. And then the third thing we said is that you need to keep the main thing the main thing. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, this week we have discovered that the adverse conditions have not changed. They have only gotten worse. 
right? And that, we can attest to that. Sometimes we think, you know, things are bad, only to find out they can get worse, right? So now we're going to add to this. What happens when adverse conditions intensify and we still have a mandate to stay focused, right? We're going to talk about three things. We're going to go on, right? The first thing we're going to spend just a little bit longer on because I think it's important for us to see it from a couple of different angles. So the first thing I need for us to remember when staying focused under adverse conditions that are intensifying, we need to remember that just because the truth is taught, that doesn't automatically mean that the truth is learned. Just because the truth is taught, it doesn't mean that the truth is necessarily learned. All right? You can have all kinds of good intentions, right? And people will still misinterpret, misunderstand, or not get what you say and do. Right? You can be doing what's right. And that doesn't necessarily reflect, right? What people are receiving. So they and I, they raise your hand. They and I have been looking at these passages together, right? As we prepare for these Sundays. And one of the questions that we had about this passage at this point was, what was it about these people in life? that kept them from being able to receive the truth, right? They were able to see the miracle and accept the miracle, but then they were unable to accept the explanation of the miracle by the people who performed the miracle. Now, the folks who performed the miracle are the people who should know why it happened, but they couldn't hear it, right? What was going on? Well, a few years ago, two psychologists did a study. Um, Dr. Sean Brady and Dr. Simon, and they did this study called the Gorilla, the Invisible Gorilla, right? You can Google it, see the video and everything when you get home, right? But the premise of the experiment was to study the human brain, and so what they did was they had a video that they showed to people, and on this video, there were six people. Three people had on white t-shirts, three people had on black t-shirts. There were two basketballs being exchanged between the people as the people were moving positions. So the folk who they were studying, they would bring them in, sit them in a room, put on the video, and they would ask them to count the number of times the basketball passed between the people in the white t-shirts. And after the video was over, they would tell them how many people, how many times it was passed, and then they would say how many people saw the gorilla in the middle of the video. Only 50% saw the gorilla. And the other 50% were surprised when they would rewind the video and midway through the video, a man in a gorilla suit would walk out into the middle of the stage, bang on his chest, and then walk off. They completely missed it the first time. Well, another psychologist who's done study, a study of, on people who consider themselves lucky versus people who consider themselves unlucky says that people miss the gorilla for the same reason they miss opportunities in their life. Because they are so focused Right? On seeing what, or finding what they want to find or see, that they are closed or not able to see things that are obvious but unexpected. Right? So he says the human brain is kind of trained to see what it wants to see. Right? We have to kind of be intentional about seeing things that are there that we're not really expecting to see. Right? And I would propose that that is exactly what was probably happening to these people. Right? They had a concept in their mind of what was possible. And everything that they encountered had to fit into that or they would just dismiss it. No, that can't be over. That's not true. Right? People block stuff sometimes, but it doesn't fit what we already believe in them. Right? If it's so counter to what we know, it's just mm, that can't be real. Right? And it's not that Paul and Barnabas did anything wrong. They preached and taught the truth. But the people were not able to receive it. They were not able to in that moment in their life of anything other than what they wanted to see. They were convinced that this was Zeus and Hermes, even though the people who were performing the miracle were saying, no, it's not. Right? Now, the reason this is important for us to consider is because it's not just other people that do this. It's not just other people who misunderstand us or misinterpret the truth. We do it too. No. It's called putting God in a box. Right? We get to a place where we can see from God in a certain way. And all of a sudden, if we aren't careful, God for us thinks just like us, acts just like us, makes determinations just like us, 
right? So we pray it, but we ain't listen to God. We just know God gonna agree with us. <laughs> and it's a very dangerous place to be. Why? Because we could actually be creating an idol God that has nothing to do with the one true God. Right? Yeah! Uh -huh. We can't conceive, and so we block God from expanding us and growing us. Right? How many of you know anybody who knows everything about God is wrong? Right? Right? Nobody emphatically knows everything about God. That's why God is God and we are we. Right? We are not God. I read this book once called Jewish with Feeling and the rabbi who wrote it once shared an account that he had. He said that he was um, on staff at a university that was started by a man who was a Buddhist. And this man was known for baiting him, this rabbi, because he was the only person on staff who believed in a monotheistic God or one God. And so he called sitting at a, at a table with some other faculty members and, you know, the founder of the university says, you know, the other day my son says to me, Daddy, is God real? And he says, no, God isn't real. He says, true. I was scared there for a minute. And he says, this founder looks at him because he knows he's begging him. So he looks at him and he says, you know, the God, the Luchi, that you don't believe in, I don't believe in either. Yeah. Right? What does that mean? That is to say that sometimes we conceive of a God in our heads that is not the one true God. But to believe in the one true God is to know that God is our creator. And it's also to know that there is never a point at which we can stop learning about God. There is never a point at which God is showing us something new about God. There is never a point where we can know emphatically everything that God thinks and knows because that would make us God. He was saying, what you have conceived in your head that you don't believe in, is it really my God? Because if you knew my God, yeah. you would understand why I believe yeah. in my God. Yeah. We gotta be careful, y'all, about how we become so close-minded mm -hmm. to the truth. And God is constantly knocking, trying to get us to expand where we are, but no, we are convinced that because we don't want to move and it doesn't fit, but we always start to believe and we're so comfortable there that God can expand us and show us something different about him, something new about him. Yeah. Just because the truth is taught, it doesn't mean the truth is learned. And you know what you're supposed to do in situations? Just roll with it. Because eventually, God and the Holy Spirit has a way of bringing that stuff back to memory when both are ready. Amen? Amen. Second thing. If you are in an adverse condition and they are intensifying, you need to be surrounded by the right people. Yeah. I don't want us to discount verse 20. Verse 20 says, But when the disciples surrounded him, he got up yeah. and went. When they surrounded him, not before, right? Not while they were being dragged out. When they surrounded him, he got up. Now, there are certain things that we're going to encounter, certain fires that we're going to walk through. That, yeah, we got to walk through them alone. They're kind of our stuff, right? But that doesn't mean that we have to walk through them without the support and love of other people. Amen. Amen. And I want us to get out of the illusion of thinking that other people are going to fully understand that. Y'all, nobody will fully, completely understand you but God. Yes. Right? They're not in your head. They don't have that capacity. But we have been given the capacity so, to support and love one another. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. There was a movie that came out several years ago called A Night's Tale. And it was starring Heath Ledger. Right? Some of you may have seen it. Maybe you know. You know, you like it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the movie, he is a poor boy. He, grow up, he grows up as a poor boy. And he, um, he and his friends need some money. So he decides that he's going to masquerade himself as a knight. To participate in all of these medieval games because you can win money, right? And he becomes very, very good at jousting, right? Makes all this money, but he's up against this villain or this guy who's been vying to bring him down for the entire movie. And in the last scene of the movie, he's been pretty beat up, right? He's on the last round of joust in the final championship game, right? This classic, you know, romantic kind of story, right? And he's weak and he's tired and he's beat up, right? Now nobody else can fight this man but him, right? His friends can't get up on the horse with him and say, I'm going to fight it for you, right? They can't say, I'm going to take on your pain and feel your pain in your body. They can't do that for him. But his friends are still.
still around him. One friend is realizing that he needs a little more time. So he interrupts the crowd to introduce him to buy him some more time. Another friend helps him tie the lance to his arm because his arm is too weak to carry it on his own. And then another friend comes up to him and he says, you know what, William? He says, your daddy is here. He says, he just heard you call by your real name, Sir William Thatcher. And the support and the love of his friends is what gave him the strength to defy the odds, right? And to be the man who was doing everything in his power to cheat and manipulate his way into the man. Right? And it wasn't because people fixed the situation for him. That's not what people are called to do in our life. They're not called to fix it. Right? They're called to love and support us. And nor do I want us to feel as if we got to have the same people around us all the time. Right? There are certain people that are in our lives for certain reasons. Right? Every conversation that I have in these support boards ain't a conversation for my mom. <laughs> there are some conversations I need to call somebody else for. <laughs> right? And you've got to have these people. But that's what this thing is about. That's what our live groups are about. That's what the church broadly speaking is about. And it's not always about people that you've known for years and years and years. Right? Shola and I were just talking this weekend about how I just came here in January and I feel like I know her and have known her all my life. Like, I have no problem calling her, and I just kind of met her because of how God has connected us. Mm -hmm. And if we look at this account, Paul is surrounded by mostly disciples that he had just met and that had just converted. He was traveling with just him and Barnabas. So these weren't people that he knew, but they were still people that he was able to draw strength from that was enough for him to get up and still keep preaching. You've got to have some good folk around you going through some crazy stuff because you got to remember you are not by yourself. Alright? Third, and maybe most difficult or most challenging, we have to learn when situations are intensifying to be gracious with our former selves. Gracious with our former Mm -hmm. We look back in Acts to chapter 7 and 8, we will find a man named Saul who is renamed Paul, which is the Paul we're talking about in this passage, right? And as Saul, Paul was responsible in chapter 7 and 8 for the death of a disciple, the stoning of a disciple by the name of Stephen, right? Saul was known notoriously for a man who would go from city to city hunting Christians in order to stone them and put them out. He was a man back in the day who could not conceive in his mind that this thing about Christ was real until he had a real encounter with God himself. So when we fast forward to chapter 14 and he is stoned by these people who are unbelieving, who cannot conceive that this Christ thing is real, who cannot conceive that this thing is, is right, right? He is literally being stoned by him, his former self. He's been, he's been stoned by people who are exactly like how he used to be, right? Sometimes we forget when we are dealing with people, right? One, where we've been, and two, where we are capable of ourselves. And it becomes easy to dehumanize people who mistreat others or mistreat us and think we're better than them, right? Because we become disconnected from where we used to be in and of ourselves. One of the best examples of this is told by our Savior Jesus in a parable called the Unforgiving Servant in Matthew 18, right? There's a parable about a king who decides that he wants all the debts repaid that are out, that are owed to him. So he begins a process of calling in and reckoning, calling in to, for people to have a reckoning and to pay up their debts that he's loaned out. And one servant comes before him owing 10,000 talents. And he says, I need for you to pay. He says, I can't pay. He says, well, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to sell you and your wife and your daughter. Well, back then, I'm using the word servant, but some accounts would say slave. Slaves during that time were people who owed money, and they had to work off that debt, and then they were free, right? So he says, I need you to pay. I'm going to have to sell you guys off. He says, no, 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 please. The man falls down on his knees and says, just be patient with me. Give me a little more time, and I will pay you. The king is moved by this man's display. He takes pity on him and he says, no, you know what? I'm just going to wipe your debt clean. You know what? You don't have to pay me anything. Oh, thank you. He is completely forgiven 
of that day. He gets up, he goes out, and he encounters a man who owes him 100 denarii, a sum considerably less than 10,000 talents. What does he do? He jacks this man up by the, by the neck, pushes him up against the wall, dude, where's my money? Want my money. He says, man, I'm sorry, I don't have it, I don't have it, but just be patient with me, and I'll give it to you. No, I want my money now. You can't pay me, I'm throwing you in jail. And that's what he does. He throws him in jail until he can pay. Well, some of the servants who are witnessing this know that this man has just been forgiven for a sum much larger, and they are so troubled in their spirit by what they saw that they go back to the king and they tell the king what they saw. The king calls this forgiven servant back, and he says, you know what? He says, I forgave you for a very large sum and a large debt. He says, but you go out and you can't forgive your brother for the debt that he owes you? He says, no, I'm sorry. You got to be punished until you can pay. There's a reason why the Bible says, forgive and you shall be forgiven. Amen. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Amen. When you give grace to other people, right? It is acting, it is an act of humility. Because no matter how much other people have mistreated people, we have mistreated people too. Yeah. We have hurt folk in our life. Yeah. And our stuff might not be other folks' stuff, but it's still some stuff. Right? Right? right. When you give grace, people are going to be more willing to give you grace. And when you encounter your former self, sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. Sometimes we bump heads with people who remind us of who we used to be. <laughs> but maybe that means we need to be starting into a process of, one, forgiving ourselves for the stuff that we've done in our past, because God already has. Amen. Right? Yeah, right? So that we can then be free to see how God has redeemed those things in our life. So that they no longer hover over us and threaten us. But we're able to freely tell people about our stories, and we are no longer threatened when we see those things in them, but we are able to be gracious towards them because we know where we were. Right, amen. Another question we had, as Dana and I were talking about this, is why was it all stone and not barnacles? And I don't know, I wasn't there. I can't say what the circumstances were, but I can only imagine that it really had a lot to do with Paul being the one to really know what it meant to be gracious, right? in the face of such pain because he had put that on so many other people. And imagine what, what a change it would have been and he got up and said, come on y'all, we're gonna go get them. Come on, let's go to the other city and, and, and tell our story first and we're gonna come back. Right? But no, what does he do? He goes, he preaches and teaches and he comes back to those cities and what a testimony for people in those cities, the new believers to say, we're gonna fast and pray together and we're gonna appoint leaders and I want you to keep spreading this message. That is a powerful testimony. Yes, it Amen. But it is a hard thing to do, family. Yes. <laughs> it is a hard thing to do and sometimes it's a process. I don't want us to think we can just get it, right? Folk that did civil rights movements throughout this world, they practice that thing. It is not, it is against your human nature to let people mistreat you and you don't buck up. Right? Right? right. But that's what this thing is about. It is about being in a community. It is about being open to God and God's truth. And it is about growing and expanding and dealing with your own stuff. <coughs> because we are called and challenged to respond differently under adverse conditions. And the only way we can do that is we got to be willing to put in the work. We got to be willing to put in the work. I do believe God has given us an avenue to be at peace in every situation. Yes. There are times when you, you can grow to a place where, yeah, you feel that moment of agitation, but you're able to calm back down. Mm -hmm. But it's a process. So for those of you who are serious about that process, last week I shared a couple of books with y'all. I shared a book about the general, in general, about death. Can we pull up that slide, please? I shared a book with those of you who are interested in the spiritual disciplines in general, right? So we talked about how the spiritual disciplines are the way in which we learn to love God back and become the people God has called us to be. Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, all right? I also shared the Sacred Art of Fasting, Preparing and Practice by Thomas Ryan. For those of you who 
are really wanting to get and grab into what it means to fast and why it's so important. And this week I'm adding a book, The Anatomy of Peace by the Art Maker Institute. This book will help you kind of think and be in dialogue around what it means to begin to see people as human beings no matter what they do. No matter what they do. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you fall. I probably fall a little bit out of the Lord knows, any given day, I might shift it back and forth. <laughs> Some days I want to block the truth because I don't want to hear it. Other days I want to be isolated in my pain. I don't want folks to know. And there are times where I'm constantly villainizing other people for how I feel like they treated me. Most of the time, it doesn't have anything to do with it. I don't know where you are. All I'm saying is that these are some steps that this scripture teaches us that will help us flow in a different way, respond in a different way, when we get into difficult situations. And we're going to be in difficult situations. Amen. Just living puts you in difficult situations. But living the way that we live and the calls we have means that, yeah, sometimes we invite this one to us. And it's okay because God wants us to.